Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sitra Podcast, your forward operations space for all things military and historical wargaming. I am your host, Ariskany Jim, and today we are back for another installment of our continuing series of war games and discussions commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Kursk. Fought between the armies of Germany and the Soviet Union in July and August of 1943, the Battle of Kursk is widely considered the largest single battle in human history. Now, if you follow our channel, you're probably something of a student of military history and know something about the Battle of Kursk. If you've been watching our channel lately, you've certainly heard me talk at length as far as the context and background for the Battle of Kursk, so I certainly won't review all that material again here. Suffice it to say, if you're interested in the wider context for the Battle of Kursk, check out some of our recent episodes. There is plenty of material for you to review. The specific battle we're going to be gaming today involves the Großdeutschland Panzer Grenadier Division in its continuing drive as the spearhead of the 48th Panzer Corps as it punches into the southern shoulder of the Soviet positions here along the Kursk salient. Now, we've already seen them in heavy-duty action in a huge game of 50mm battle group at the Battle of Cherkaskoye. It's now three days later, with Panzer Grenadier Division Großdeutschland still in the lead, has now pushed up, and the whole of 48th Panzer Corps is beginning this great wheeling motion here to the west. They've punched through the Soviet position, and what they're trying to do now is almost like a crowbar jammed into concrete. They're trying to pry it apart from the inside. A big part of that effort is going to come when the Großdeutschland Division tries to force a crossing over the Pina River, which you can barely see outlined here, and they're going to run into a series of problems here between the towns of Berkopenje and Sertsevo. Those problems are going to naturally come in the form of Soviet resistance. Again, 48th Panzer Corps has already made relatively short work of 22nd Guards Rifle Corps, the first part of their resistance was made of the 71st and 67th Guards Rifle Divisions. The second echelon of that defense was the 90th Guards Rifle Division. That's pretty much taken care of. And what's happening now is that the Soviet 6th Guards Army Foreign Edge Front is bringing in more reinforcements and reserves from deeper in their backfield. The biggest single reserve formation under direct command of the Voron Edge Front is right here, the 1st Guards Tank Army under command of General Mikhail Efimovich Katakov. Now, he was originally laggered back here at Obayan, and as the German attack hit and the situation immediately devolved far worse than the Soviets were expecting, he was called into frontline service much sooner than originally planned. It was supposed to be maybe the second or third week of the battle. Here, he's right in the middle of the thick of it, pretty much on day three. So what we see by the evening of 7th July, moving into the morning of 8th July, is the Großdeutschland Division still in the vanguard of the 48th Panzer Corps, moving up to about this position here. We can see the Russian lettering for Großdeutschland position right there. You see where they've already pushed past 3rd Mechanized Corps by 2400 hours on July 7th. They've got 11th Panzer Division rolling up on their flank. 3rd Panzer Division is right alongside. What they're doing is pushing back against the remnants of 3rd Mechanized Corps. They've already got their teeth kicked in, and already there's not a lot of them left. This is where we see the vanguard of Großdeutschland Division push into our immediate battle area for today, and again, threaten those crossings across the Pina River. Now, clearly, what's left of the unfortunate 3rd Mechanized Corps is not going to stop Großdeutschland. And so what Katakov has to do is commit the second echelon of his reserves. That's going to be the 6th Tank Corps we see entering here. And in a nutshell, that's pretty much the context for today's game of Panzer Blitz. We've got 48th Panzer Corps, spearheaded by Gross Deutschland Panzer Grenadier Division, backed up by 3rd and 11th Panzer Divisions, making a big threatening push towards those river crossings. They're up against a hasty, sketchy, rapidly crumbling defense mounted by the 3rd Mechanized Corps, while forward elements of Katakov's 6th Tank Corps, 1st Tank Army, is rushing in to the rescue. Here's the game map that's been custom designed for this scenario. Very clearly we see the gap between the towns of Sertsevo and the southern suburbs of Verkopenje. We also see very clearly the course of the Pina River that the Germans are trying to cross. We also see the five objective hexes the Germans are going to try and take today. The first one is at the town of Gramucci. 
it is vital for Gross Deutschland Division to take and hold that crossroads in order to maintain good contact and communication with 11th Panzer Division over on their right flank. The second one they're going to try and take is this northern suburb hex here at Sertsevo. This is to make sure that the Germans truly control the town and haven't just bypassed it. The next two objectives on the Germans' mission list are again these crossings over the Pina River here. And lastly, we have a breakthrough hex leading toward Novosolovka, which is the next big target on 48th Panzer Corps' advance list. The Germans are going to be coming in along the southern edge of the map. The units that represent the remnants of 3rd Mechanized Corps can set up pretty much wherever they want, and the units representing the vanguard of the 6th Tank Corps are going to be coming in along the northern edge of the map sometime on turn 4. Here we see elements of the 10th Mechanized Brigade. This is the part of 3rd Mechanized Corps that's trying to hold this particular stretch of the line. They're deployed, ready to slow down the Germans as best they can, but spoiler alert, they're not going to last very long. They are really depending on the vanguard of 6th Tank Corps to arrive down from the north and come to the rescue. Meanwhile, we've got the Germans ready to go. Now, Gross Deutschland Division started off probably one of the most powerful units in 4th Panzer Army, but by this stage of the Battle of Kursk, they're not doing so hot. The fighting at Cherkaskoye and through the three days since has been extremely tough, and it shows here in the German order of battle. Pretty much all the real armored striking power that Gross Deutschland Division has left has been condensed into a single ad hoc battle group called Kampfgruppe Strachwitz. This battle group was named for its commander, Graf Heisen von Strachwitz, the so-called Panzer Count. He actually was a count in German nobility and one of the top armored commanders anywhere along the Eastern Front. He's got a small force of Tigers still in his force. Gross Deutschland was one of the very few divisions in the German army to be favored with its own integral Tiger unit. He does have some Panthers from originally 10th Panzer Brigade. These were the Panthers that were used for the very first time at the Battle of Kursk just three days ago. They didn't do very well because of a variety of mechanical problems. These guys are still subject to those problems and they're gonna be reflected in the special rules of the scenario. Now this German force might look pretty formidable, and yes, they are going up against very scattered and depleted Soviet defense positions. However, they've got a lot of ground to cover, they're on the clock, and again, 6th Tank Corps is coming down from the north. So with all that out of the way, the Soviets are set up, the Germans are ready, let's get this game underway. Okay, so phase one of the German plan is going to see them come on the table very hard and fast and immediately invest Sertsevo because there is an objective hex in there that I want to take as quickly as humanly possible. Same deal over here at Kormuchi. There's another objective hex there that Cross Deutschland has to take post haste. Okay, so let's start off here at Sertsevo. The first thing the Germans are going to try and do is get rid of some of these trucks with some overrun attacks by empty half-tracks. That's going to trigger some opportunity fire here from the Soviet anti-tank guns. They are at a range of two hexes. Their total range is only three, so it stays at five. Five to four, that's going to be one-to-one -one odds. Let's see what happens. Uh, six, that is a clean whiff, and so far the Germans are doing pretty well. So on an overrun attack, two to one becomes three to one. Three to one subtracts two from the die roll for overrun attack, and the Germans get a modified zero. That is one truck already smoked. The Germans are now bringing in some additional half tracks to continue these overruns. So here comes a second platoon of half tracks. They're gonna try an overrun here on this hex. Two to one becomes three to one, subtract two from the die roll. A two becomes a zero. Those trucks are also smoked. And now as the Germans continue to bring in more and more of these half-tracks, I want to bring in some half-tracks here and I want to try and overrun on this truck because there's the objective hex I have to get to. Here's where we're going to run into some problems. There's another half company of T-70As that are now at point-blank range ready for some opportunity fire. So now we're looking at 10 to 4. That is going to be 2 to 1 odds on an opportunity fire shot. Let's see what happens. A six, the Germans got lucky again. No effect on war opportunity fire. These rolls are on camera, folks. And now another overrun is gonna go into those trucks and that's gonna be the end of them as well. Even better, some of the heavy Soviet defenses have now taken their opportunity fire and they won't be able to fire for the rest of the turn. 
Word to the wise though, there is a half company of T-34 sitting right on that objective hex and he is in concrete buildings. So that's gonna be a pretty tough nut to crack. Continuing with turn one and the German entry onto the table, I realized I made a slight mistake with the Soviet opportunity fire. I forgot there was a battery of 762 millimeter divisional guns hiding in that urban hex. So I went back, I allowed him to take some retroactive opportunity fire, and that did cost the Germans a platoon of half tracks. So the Germans were still able to execute that multiple chain of overruns that wiped out all the Soviet truck spoiler positions. It just cost them a platoon of half tracks to do so. That also has some knock on effects for the planned German close assault right into the village of Sertsevo, because as we all know, half tracks are considered armored fighting vehicles, and thus when they are destroyed, they generate a wreck counter, and wreck counters affect the stacking limit within a hex. So now these pioneers are going to have to go in there by themselves, although they do have a company of German infantry, some SMGs and rifles, going in there on their left wing. We're going to try to close assault this whole center hex of Sertsevo and take out those tanks, divisional guns, and rifle platoons. I've got another close assault getting set up over here on these two Soviet rifle platoons in an improved position in woods. That's going to be kind of a tough nut to crack. So what to do with all this German armor? You know, for about a minute, I was half tempted to send all these Panzers straight up the center of the field, take some of that key commanding terrain in the middle of the table, maybe even go for those bridges and make the Soviets attack the Germans instead of vice versa. But if I do that, the Germans will have nothing left with which to invest this Gramucci strong point over here on their right wing. So here's what we're going to do instead. I'm going to lead off with some of my more expendable armor, this platoon of Mark III Specials. And they're going to try to overrun this platoon of trucks. Again, the Soviets have a lot of their trucks set up in these spoiling positions in order to keep me from getting close and spotting their actual real units for off-board artillery missions. However, as my Mark III's move in there, that will trigger some opportunity fire from this company of T-34Cs and this battery of 45 millimeter anti-tank guns. So the range is three. That means nothing doubles, nothing halves. Um, actually, I think the 45 battery might have. Yeah, because he's, okay, he's gonna be only half. So it looks like it's gonna be a total of 18 plus three makes 21 versus seven. That's barely three to one odds. However, we do have to add one to the die roll because the Germans are in woods. Let's see how lucky the Soviets get on opportunity fire. Three to one, add one to the die roll. Uh, two plus one makes three on the three to one. That is a platoon of Mark III's wrecked. So I'll set them on fire in just a second. And that will be the opportunity fire for that whole stack. Okay, that was kind of costly. All right, now we're going to move in with some more. And I think that's pretty much it for everything else's infantry. All right, so now the Germans more or less have a free hand everywhere else here. It's time to just start overrunning the hell out of this stuff. So it's going to be overrun, overrun, overrun. Yeah, uh, we're going to wipe out all these trucks. I'm also going to push some German tanks right up against these T-34s so that next turn when it's the germans turn to fire the soviets have already taken their fire that's going to be it i'm also going to move in some of my heavy artillery these are batteries of vespa self-propelled 10.5 centimeter howitzers i'm going to make sure through the rest of my movement phase that none of these soviet units can fire at them or close assault them or anything like that and i'm putting them there in those woods because that woods hex has a line of sight on this objective hex and I also hope to have some German units in these hexes by the end of my turn. So I'll have direct line of sight on that objective hex when we get to the next German fire phase. All right, I have now completed the rest of German movement. We're going to go ahead and close out the German turn with the close assault tactics. We're affectionately known as the cat attack. So I've got three, three, and six. That's 12 plus three more makes 15 versus Soviet 14. It's one to one odds. However, there are pioneers in the close assault that jacks it up to two to one odds. Subtract two from the die roll, add one to the die roll because he's in wooden buildings. So net two to one, subtract one from the die roll. Let's go to Mr. Camera and see what we wind up with. So the Germans roll a two minus one becomes one on the two to one. 
That is one unit destroyed, two units destroyed, and a Soviet wreck counter. That is going to be it for that hex. Moving swiftly on to this other close assault, which actually might be a little bit tougher because there are two rifle platoons in there. I have a grand total of, again, 12 versus 12. No combat engineers this time, so it's one to one. And we are actually adding one to the die roll because we have woods and improved position. So the improved position adds two to the die roll. The woods add one to the die roll. Close assault subtracts two from the die roll. We wind up with one to one. Net add one to the die roll. The Germans roll a one though, so that's going to be a net two that is going to disperse these two units, which is good enough for now. Soviet turn one, on the other hand, will not be terribly impressive. Just about everything that can fire has fired during the opportunity fire phase. They're now going to be trying to rally dispersed units. They're going to be shaking off opportunity fire counters. They're going to be calling in some artillery on one hex where they are gambling that the Germans will not be moving. They have two off-board batteries of 122mm howitzers and an on-board battery of Kachushas. About the only thing of note they're really going to be doing on turn one is a mass close assault on this hex of German armor right here. So we have a grand total of 6 plus 6 makes 12 versus 24 plus 7. It's going to be 1 to 3 odds. However, we do subtract 2 from the roll. So let's see how lucky these guys get from Mother Russia. And a 6, so not very helpful. 6 minus 2 becomes 4 on the 1 to 3 table. Yeah, that has no effect. Actually, the Soviet player will take one more quick movement action. They will go ahead and move this armored car half company straight down this road and sneak into this hex that was just emptied out by a previous German close assault. I counted a couple times. There was no window for opportunity fire from these various German overwatch positions. Those armored cars were just too fast. Those are BA-64s, especially once they caught that road and started getting the double road movement rate. As the Germans begin their turn two, their first item is to decide where to set up their next turn's artillery barrage. They're going to go ahead and call in both batteries of their off-board 15-centimeter howitzers right there on the objective hex of Tsertsevo. There's still some pretty powerful defensive units in there, and they are in concrete buildings. Next up comes German direct fire. We're going to start with this battery of Stugs right here. They were going to fire on these T-34s here in the objective hex, maybe soften it up for some upcoming cat attacks. But honestly, now that these armored cars have appeared, I'm going to go ahead and shift the fire and the Stugs are going to engage those armored cars. Maybe free up that hex so the engineers can get into the town and start launching cat attacks against Soviet targets from within the town. So the Stugs are within two hexes. That means that their A-class weapons will double against an armored target at this range. That gives the Stug battery, instead of a 12, a 24. Even adding plus one to the German die roll for these wooden buildings, it's still 24 against two. That's 12 to one odds. That's going to be the end of the road for those armored cars. And that hex is now again open for German infantry, although there are two wreck counters in there. And now these Stugs have taken their fire phase. Over here on the German right wing, we also have all kinds of direct fire. Panthers, Tigers, Two platoons of Mark IVs and a platoon of Mark III Specials. They are all within two hexes of this improved position with a full company of T-34Cs. All of these German weapons are A-class. They're all within two hexes, so they all double. All that firepower added up equals 138 points after it doubles against 18 defensive points for both of those half companies of T-34Cs. It equals a grand total of 7 to 1, but I have to add 2 for the improved position and 1 for the woods. So, 7 to 1, add 3 to the German die roll. A 3 becomes a 6, which at 7 to 1 destroys all those T-34s. And now comes the real attack. Everything else that has line of sight, including both batteries of Vespas, who are using direct fire, so those 13s will double to 26 points apiece. Conversely, all this German armor down here will divide, because it's an A-class weapon against soft targets. Also, that stack of Soviet infantry will get five added to its defense, because they are in concrete buildings. 
So all of this German firepower adds up to 105 points. Again, some of it doubles and some of it divides in half. So you do all the math, you wind up with 105 points. Meanwhile, we have 18 total points here for the Soviets. However, they get to add five because they are in concrete buildings. These are Arab Israeli wars, urban hex rules. The Germans will also have to add one to their die roll. Long story short, take your first shot. We're talking about a four to one roll, adding one to the German die roll. Four to one, add one to the German die roll. A two becomes a three. That will result in these three units being destroyed. And with the split move and fire, which some German AFVs have access to, in other words, the tanks, just not the Stugs, we're gonna go ahead and occupy that objective hex. So now one objective hex has fallen to the Germans. At the beginning of their turn two, it would seem that the Soviets were due for a whole lot of payback because all their artillery was gonna hit. That's two batteries of offboard 122s, onboard battery of Katyusha's, two onboard batteries of 82 millimeter mortars, and an onboard battery of 120 millimeter mortars. That equals a grand total of 59 points. The problem is all the units that were spotting for that attack have either been destroyed or dispersed. So the Soviets are gonna have to roll on the scatter diagram for each individual battery to see where this stuff lands and what effect it has on either German or potentially even, depending on the scatter, Soviet forces. All right, just to make things clear, I went ahead and added numbers that showed the artillery values of each Soviet battery after we resolved its scatter. So some of it did actually land where it was intended, some of it fell off the board, and a little of it will land on their own troops. One battery of 122 millimeter howitzers does unfortunately land on their own dispersed rifle platoons in the objective city. So now these are all separate attacks which we have to start to resolve. We have a total of 18 points versus eight, versus eight, versus six. So that's gonna be two, two to ones. And that is going to be dispersed, dispersed, and then a three to one against that submachine gun section. That's gonna be a six, that's also gonna be dispersed. The Soviets also have to resolve their own artillery against their own targets, unfortunately. That's gonna be 13, actually not to six, 13 to 11. Remember, they're in concrete buildings, they do get a plus five defense bonus, even against their own artillery. So we have two one-to-ones, however, we're adding one to the die roll for the buildings. We're subtracting one from the die roll because they're dispersed. And because they're already dispersed, a double D result on the combat results table will result in a kill. So two one-to-ones, those are two Soviet kills to their own artillery. And then probably of less importance, we have 13 versus 14. Again, the T-34 is nine plus five for buildings. Also, I have to divide that artillery in half because it's gonna be firing against armored targets. So we are looking at a seven against 14. That's an even one to two, plus one and negative one from the die roll. So here we go. Uh, five on one to two, that's gonna be no additional effect on those T-34s. All right, so here is the final outcome for the Soviet artillery phase. Not the most fortunate result for the Soviets, but it is what it is. All right, the Soviets have had a little bit more luck over here on the German right where a close assault did roll a one with six points against 19. The Germans were trying to be savvy and barely force a four to one against the expected cat attack. But with a one, they still managed to disperse a platoon of Tigers and Mark IVs. And this anti-tank gun did take a medium range shot at this platoon of Mark IVs and again, force a dispersal. To be fair, these two southern objective hexes, the Soviets were never gonna hold them. The Soviet object down here was to play for time and to maybe bleed a little bit of the German force so that when the sixth tank corps shows up from the north, those northern three objectives are more in play. Okay, fast forwarding a little bit through turn three, the German artillery landed on that half company of dispersed Soviet T-34s in that urban hex did absolutely nothing because artillery is not usually very effective against tanks, especially in built up areas, even if they're already dispersed. However, these Stugs and then two batteries of mortars which have joined them managed to put some fire right in there out of the east. And these little half tracks armed with five centimeter guns were disproportionately effective because they were point blank range. So their five attack value multiplied to 10. And yeah, that was the end of the T-34. Two platoons of half-tracks then moved in, and now the Germans own a second objective X. 
Next up, we had some German direct fire out of this hex here, where there are light howitzers and flat guns mounted on half tracks, and managed to put some fire up here into this urban hex and disperse that Katusha battery as it was trying to reload another salvo of rockets. Clearly, when all that Soviet artillery fired out of those urban hexes, those batteries became spotted. However, the Soviets put them in those concrete building hexes for a reason. They're going to be surprisingly tough to dig out of there. There was a bit of an armored car jousting competition over here where German armored cars were trying to flank around where some Soviet BA-64s were here in an overwatch position. The idea was to force the Soviet armored cars to take opportunity fire no matter which way they retreated. It didn't quite work, however, the Soviets did manage to squeeze out an escape path right around through there so that they would never actually be in line of sight with German forces long enough to take opportunity fire. Meanwhile, the two batteries of German Vespas here took another point-blank direct fire blast into this hex where there were two platoons of Soviet submachine gunners deleted that hex and it's now been occupied by some empty German trucks. Some other nearby German units took a moment to clean out some of the clutter, like empty Russian trucks that were clogging up this town, then used split moving fire to blitz up this road as fast as they could. Other German units that didn't have to fire were able to use their full movement rate and get much further along. The German idea here is to threaten these improved positions, especially this third objective hex here, maybe even take it on turn four before vanguard elements of the 6th tank corps show up. One more small detail of note, the Germans have finally suffered their first panther failure. So the Germans have to make a D6 whenever they want to move a panther. On a 5, the panther doesn't move at all. And on a 6, it actually catches fire, flames out, and is considered a destroyed unit. Everyone knows the story of the Panthers, how Kursk was their very first time in combat. They were rushed into production, and they had a host of mechanical problems with their drive chains, their muffler systems. They were just a mechanical disaster at Kursk, and this game does take that into account. So this German armored column is a little strung out here along the road. They're going to have turn four to hopefully take this objective hex and then at the same time set up one hell of a defensive position because on the Soviet movement phase of turn four, there is a whole lot of T-34s and T-70s showing up out of the north. As far as the Soviets go on their turn three, the first thing they're going to do is assign their turn four artillery mission which is going to target this battery of German infantry guns that actually did help disperse those Kachushas. I forgot to mention that before. So they're now spotted, which means they're now artillery bait for Soviet guns. Their current artillery is going to land here. It's a total of 44 points. Remember, they don't get to shoot the Kachushas this turn. And it divides because it's all landing on armored targets, so it's going to be 22 points. However, it affects all of those half-tracks individually. That is going to be three five to one attacks add one to the soviet die roll for woods so here comes the soviet artillery one one and four that's going to be three kills that four is still a kill because it's red as a five because of the german woods but on the five to one table a five still gets it done okay german turn four this is going to be very important to the outcome of the game so we're going to go through it nice and slow first thing the germans have to do is set up their next turn's artillery barrage they're going to send it right there on those Kachushas and mortars they weren't able to target last time. And for this turn's artillery, the barrage is going to come right there. That's going to be 20 plus 20 equals 40 points, landing first on 8 and then on 7. Remember, that is a concrete building hex in which those batteries are located. That comes out to two 5 to 1 attacks, add 1 to the die roll for the urban hex. There go the light mortars, and there go the heavy mortars. Next, we're going to be taking some direct fire up here to the northeast with these Panther platoons. It seems kind of silly using Panthers against empty Soviet trucks, but I want that objective hex cleared, and I want it done by units that can use split move and fire and then occupy that hex before those new Soviet tanks arrive. That first Panther platoon has a 16 attack strength. It does divide down to 8 because I'm firing against soft targets. That's still 8 to 1. However, I will be adding 3 to the die roll. Two for this improved position, and of course, one for the woods. So, eight to one, add three to the die roll. 
two and that is going to be the truck knocked out of there and that objective hex is now clear we'll go ahead and use the split moving fire rule i want those stugs in there and the panther that just fired that platoon is also going to occupy that hex all right russians the germans are now technically winning the game by owning three objective hexes the burden of attack now lies with the soviets we're now going to shove up the rest of this german armored column on the road so one two off the road three four five six seven and these mark fours will join them as well Again, the German idea is to reinforce this position as well as they can because they are about to eat one hell of a Soviet counterattack. Not everything is going well for the Germans, though. They went to move that straggling Panther platoon, and wouldn't you know it, they rolled a six. So this platoon of Panthers, the mufflers, have now built up too much unburnt fuel in their exhaust pipes, and those exhaust pipes are hot. They eventually catch fire, and the tanks literally catch fire and blow up right there on the battlefield. It's an annoying way for the Germans to lose one of their most powerful units, but this was just the historical truth at Kursk. These Panthers were simply not ready. Meanwhile, the Germans are going to mop up some of the remaining Soviet defenses around Gromuchi. The first thing they're going to do is that 81mm mortar battery is going to drop a direct fire barrage on those two sections of Soviet trucks in the open. So that's going to be two 3 to 1 attacks. And that's it, they are both smoked. Meanwhile, the Germans have just about had it with this battery of 45mm anti-tank guns harassing their flank and rear, so they're going to use one of their Vespa batteries, and one only, to do a direct fire salvo right into their position. It doubles for direct fire at within half range, so that's going to be 26 versus 3, 7 to 1 odds, add 3 to the die roll. So let's see what happens here. Boom! He smoked as well. Go ahead and take him off the field, replace him with the smoke column. And that's pretty much the end of the Soviet position here at Kramuchi. Now, what's significant about the way the Germans executed that attack are the units that did not fire. They're now free to start moving north. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here, one to get on the road. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to reinforce that all-important position that's really going to kick off later on in turn four. Okay, we're now into Soviet turn four. There's been some artillery barrages, there's been some direct fire, but now we're in the movement phase and here's where things are going to get very, very hairy. Because not one, but two full brigades of six tank corps are showing up. We're going to do the 112 first. So let's go ahead and get this going. So the Soviets are going to start bringing on their armor. They're going to start off with a full company of T-70s. And they're going to launch an overrun against these two platoons of German Mark III's and Mark IV's. Note, these German platoons will not be able to see because of the tree line in 2401, nor will these German tanks here because of this tree line here. It's down to just these guys to defend themselves. All right, so 14 doubles to 28, 10 doubles to 20. Both against six, that's going to be a four to one attack and a three to one attack. Okay, so here comes the four to one. Boom, here comes the three to one. Boom, he's also smoked. All right, so that will be this company of T-70s deleted off the table and replaced with wreck counters. Those wreck counters are going to be important because there's more Soviets coming on the table. All right, the Soviets are going to bring on some real tanks now. They can only sadly bring in one half company into this hex because there are two wreck counters in there and it does affect the stacking limits in that hex. However, these guys have taken their opportunity to fire. None of these people, believe it or not, have a line of sight. There is only one more platoon of Mark III Specials back here and they're not within point blank range. So they'll only get 10 versus nine. That's gonna be one to one. A one, holy crap, they killed them. The Soviets are now going to bring in another 15 T-34s and they're going to try and overrun over from this position. The only problem there, and what I was trying to avoid before, is that that now opens up opportunity fire from these two hexes as well. So here's where it's going to get very, very nasty. So these Stugs are within point blank range, so that gives them to 24. 24 is 48, and 16 doubles to 32. That's a total of 80 points. If they engage one full company, that's two counters. That will be two nines become 18. That's gonna be four to one odds. Here comes the fire. 
pow, that whole company is smoked. It's going to be two more of these counters removed and two more wreck counters. The Soviets are going to continue to bring in more and more armor, rather piteously because we're playing the Soviets. Almost all the armor they have left, however, that will open up more opportunity fire from this hex. We're going to start off with 28 versus 6, that's 4 to 1. Boom, he smoked. We're going to follow that up with 32 versus 9, that's an ugly 3 to 1. I'm going to go ahead and go for it. A 6, the Soviets finally catch a break, that does still, however, disperse that tank. And then finally, Tiger versus T-70s. Who's walking away from this get together? 30 versus six, that is going to be a five to one attack. Boom, he's really, really smart. The Germans have now all taken their opportunity to fire. The Soviets have one half company of armor left in the 112th. One, two, three, four, five, two points to overrun. Those T-70s are gonna join the overrun and we're gonna see if we can take at least two platoons of German armor with us. So it's nine plus five is 14 versus 14. One to one, two to one, subtract two from the die roll. So two to one, subtract two from the die roll for overrun. Boom, the Soviets get lucky for a change. Two platoons of German armor are now smoked. Now that seemed like a ridiculous trade, but here's the thing. Soviet tank brigades don't just have tanks, they have infantry as well. And guess what's coming in now? Here comes a full company of submachine gunners. Here comes a full company of rifles. And I'm not able to, let's see here, one, there's now two German wreck counters in there, so I can only put one platoon in there. Boom, and I'm gonna hang back with these other two platoons because they're gonna be used as spotters for future Soviet artillery missions. So it cost the Soviets the better part of a tank brigade to make this move, but we now have a close assault coming of monstrous proportions on that German-held objective hex. So we have a grand total of 17 attack points going in there against 36. That is going to be an ugly one to three. However, they get to subtract two from the die roll because it's a close assault. However, they have to add two to the die roll for their own improved positions and then another one for the woods. So it's one to three, add one to the die roll. Oh man, and a 6 becomes a 7. The Soviets just aren't catching a break on this one. No effect on the German armor. Alright, wrapping up Soviet turn 4. They're bringing in more infantry of 200th Tank Brigade. A little bit of 200th Tank Brigade came in to reinforce the unfortunate 112th, but the rest of it has simply bypassed the German position. And some of it is coming all the way down this road. And boom, just that fast, Kramucci is back in play. Here's an empty section of trucks, an 81 millimeter mortar battery, and a little bit of self-propelled artillery. That's all that's holding Gramucci. And now it's being threatened by 20 more tanks. Most of the 200th Tank Brigade's infantry came in here and made sure that the Germans were not going to take these two bridges here in Verkopenje. They were getting close. We did have a little bit of a German force here just beginning to threaten that position. I don't think it's going to fall now, to be honest. The Soviets also have some artillery coming in on it. I don't like those Germans. Those Germans are probably going to have to pull out of there in a big hurry. One little renegade half company of T-34s has raced down here and overrun two sections of empty German half tracks. And the Soviets have also brought in two more batteries of 82 millimeter mortars. They're going to set up a little fire base back there. And there are also two more batteries of 76.2 millimeter divisional guns deployed in the anti-tank role. First, one battery here to provide some fire support in this ongoing battle to the northeast. And the second one, again, as insurance, just to make sure the Germans don't try and get cute and try and swipe either that objective hex or that objective hex. So as expected, these two new brigades of 6th Tank Corps have definitely been a huge game changer already, but that's okay because the Germans have a few surprises left of their own. That's right, because on turn five, the Germans start bringing on their Stukas, specifically their JU-87G, or Gustav variant, armed with twin 37mm anti-tank autocannon. They will have to deal with some Soviet air defense. There's a battery of 37mm guns I have to worry about over there, and some Dushkas, although the Dushkas are too far away. However, these 37s will get a shot, so we have to resolve that first. 
Here is the anti-aircraft table. We are on the eight column because there's eight points in that 37 millimeter anti-aircraft battery. Let's see what the Soviets get. A4 is gonna be no effect, so the Stuka gets to go ahead and carry out his attack. He's within two hexes. That's considered a close range for an A-class weapon. That's gonna be 20 to nine. So let's see what the Germans get on the two to one table. Boom, a two. That is going to be a destroyed half company of T-34Cs. Nice. Looks like two more Stukas are coming in. The first one's gonna make a 20 point attack at two to one against that dispersed half company of T-34s. So minus one on the two to one table and a double D will kill it. The Germans make their attack. Four minus one becomes a three. That will be a double D on the two to one table because that half company was already dispersed. He is now considered destroyed. This Stuka here is going to try a 20 point attack against this T-70 half company here. It's gonna be a three to one attack, 20 versus six. And he is smoked as well. Now the Stukas are limited in their ammunition. They get their normal strafing attack, four attacks as per Pain's leader air attack rules. It's just that they have those 37 millimeter auto cannons. So we're gonna have to make sure that we keep track of the gun ammo on these Gustavs because clearly they're pretty effective. Okay, fast forwarding a little bit because this video is getting a little too long. Here is the situation at the end of turn six. So the first thing that happened was the Germans finally wrapped up this ongoing infantry battle that was taking place with that company of Soviet riflemen bottled up in that improved position back there on their left wing. The German Stugs and Martyrs started to very, very quickly buzz down this road as quickly as they were able to. Their object was to reinforce Gramucci before Remnants of the 200th Tank Brigade actually took the town back. They wound up getting caught in a double cat attack here and here. The first Soviet close assault actually managed to halt the column because all those Stugs and Martyrs paused to offer opportunity fire against the incoming cat attack and they don't have turrets so they don't have access to the split move and fire rule. This means that they had to almost automatically eat a second cat attack and that one with a lucky one actually has the entire column disrupted. The German Stukas turned south and started shooting up the Russian tanks that were threatening Gramucci. They didn't get all of them though because one half company of T-34s managed to sneak back around and overrun the Vespas and destroy that battery of self-propelled artillery. Successive German artillery barrages both on and off board have completely annihilated this SMG company here and busted up these raftmen over here a little bit. Meanwhile, the remaining Soviet tanks that were over here, the Germans didn't get to return fire at first because they shot early during opportunity fire phase. That did give the Soviets a little bit of a fire phase with their T-34s pretty close up. They did manage to kill one Panther platoon here, and they managed to knock out a platoon of Mark IVs here. So German tanks are taking losses. In an effort to lift as much anti-tank fire as possible off of those German tanks, the German armored cars did a blitz down the hill and tried to overrun the Soviet 76.2 millimeter divisional guns. They actually did get them. However, the losses were pretty bad. Some of the armored cars were dispersed. They failed to rally. Some of the Soviet infantry turned back around and launched a double close assault. And now two platoons of German armored cars are on fire. So two Panther platoons out of three have been destroyed. Half of the Vespas have been destroyed. Mark IVs are on fire, Mark III's are on fire, most of their armored cars are on fire. All their assault guns and tank destroyers are also in a pretty bad way at the moment. Indeed, the Soviets are fighting very, very hard. That said, I don't think they're going to be able to retake the objective hex here at Gramucci. I'm pretty positive they're never going to be able to retake this objective hex heading up toward Novoslovska. Those two batteries of Stugs are standing tall in woods in an improved position. The entire 112th Tank Brigade is burning in front of them. Okay, they had plenty of Mark IVs, Panthers, and Tigers, and fire support, but suffice it to say that Objective Hex is not going anywhere. Clearly, the Germans also hold securely this one way down here in Sertsevo, so that's going to give them at least three out of five, probably victory for the game. At the same time, the Soviets now have a nice little defensive bulwark here along these urban hexes. I don't see the Germans mounting any kind of serious threat against either of these bridge hexes over here in Verkopenje. All right, everyone, here we are at the end of turn eight and where we're going to call the game for today. 
Starting off here in the northeast, despite the best efforts of both sides, there was never any real danger of this little deadlock breaking loose. German tanks, as formidable as they are, carry A-class guns, which are not terribly effective against infantry in woods. The Tiger Platoon is of course armed with 88mm guns, that gives it an A-star class, which means that it doesn't have to divide against soft targets. But even with some German Vespa artillery support, the Germans were never really able to close down the remnants of 112th Tank Brigade's Motor Rifle Battalion. Trust me, the Germans really would have liked to because the rest of the battalion started hoofing it down this road almost in column formation, perfect overrun bait. But again, the tanks were just tied up holding that objective hex. And right when I said there was no way that the Soviets were going to be able to retake the Gromuchi Objective X, sure enough, an off-board artillery barrage did delete the Sherman 8.1cm mortar that was hanging out in there and allowed a half company of T-70s to swoop in there and, for a moment, retake the Objective X. He was observed, however, by German armor that was in these two hexes. In comes the one of the last Stuka airstrikes and took him back out of there. Some light German armor then reoccupied the X, and there we go. Meanwhile, the aforementioned remnants of 112th Tank Brigade's motorized rifle battalion did try a cat attack up the hill just for fun to knock out some of these armored cars. It just didn't work out. The German Stugs and Mortar Tank Destroyers that found themselves in a little bit of trouble here along this road managed to extricate themselves, roll up to this position, and actually knock out a half company of T-70s, and at least threaten a little bit one of these bridges here at Verkopenje. You'll notice that there's an entire company of Soviet infantry missing there. There is line of sight just barely from way down here in Sertsevo. They were able to peer right down this little channel and call in a German off-board artillery strike and delete that company right off the bridge. So the Germans never had a real hope of taking either of those two bridge hexes in Verkopenje, but they did manage to attack some of them and cause the Soviets a bit of a nervous moment. But by this point of the game, we've gone eight full turns. Both sides have begun to lose the real ability to damage each other. The Germans would be able to reorganize another attack on Verkopenje. They would just need like four turns to do it. But the game has now run its eight turn course and we're gonna go ahead and call it. This is gonna be a German victory because again, they do have Objective Hex 1, Objective Hex 2, and Objective Hex 3 out of five. To their credit, however, the Soviets do still hold one objective hex there and one there. All told, the losses were pretty catastrophic, especially on the Soviet side, which actually lines up with history. If we look at these wreck counters here, where 112th Tank Brigade more or less died in place, we're going to see roughly the same kind of tank kill ratios that we saw actually in the Battle of Kursk. Altogether, the tank kill ratios were measured at about 8 to 1. That's going to vary a little bit depending on what divisional sector you're talking about, but that's pretty much what we saw here on our table. Conversely, we also saw the death of Panzer Abteilung 51 and 52, 39th Panzer Regiment, 10th Panzer Brigade, in other words, the Panthers. The Germans started off with three platoons of Panthers. There's only one left, and it is in fact dispersed at the moment, so that platoon is about half destroyed. And that, again, pretty much lines up with the history. These battles at Sertsevo and Verkopenje, about three or four days into the larger Battle of Kursk, was pretty much the end of the Panther, at least here at the Battle of Kursk. So, once again, that's going to wrap us up for today. Thanks very much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And also, please remember to hit that notification bell. Also, please consider joining the SITREP Podcast Discord. There is an auto-accept invitation link to our Discord in the description of this video. Come by, check out the community, and show us what's happening on your hobby table. But for now, this is Sir Skinny Jim with the SITREP Podcast. We are rounds complete for another episode. And as always, Tango Mike for watching.